I'd like to show you the Crossway ESV Church History Study Bible today. It is a little bit larger than a diadem. This is a Cambridge ESV diadem. It's about perhaps three quarters of an inch taller than that. And it's a little thicker and a little wider than the diadem. A similar concept, although focused on older writers, is this uh, CSB, Ancient Faith Study Bible, which is a bit taller and uh, wider, and it has gold page edges. A little thicker too. Yeah, somewhat thicker. It is much smaller than your standard ESB study Bible. This is my old copy. It's about 10, 12 years old. Much larger book. And finally, this is the Lutheran Study Bible. The Lutheran Study Bible is much wider, about the same height, and thicker. So it is, in terms of dimensions, 9 and 3 eighths inches tall, 6 and 3 eighths inches wide, and 1.8 inches thick at the spine. I'm going to take the dust jacket off and show you the cover. It's just a brown cover with a lot of gold here on the spine. Single brown ribbon marker. We'll look at that more carefully later. Nothing fancy about it at all. This is typical for an ESB. Text is arranged in two columns. Here each column is 61 millimeters wide. So we have 61 millimeters from here to here. There are about 47 characters per line and as many as about 49 uh, lines of text per column. It varies from page to page because you have the text and translation notes, the references, and uh, the notes, explanatory notes at the bottom of the page. Page dimensions are 231 by 154 millimeters. That's 9.09 .09 inches tall, 6.06 .06 inches wide. The margins, and I count, I'm measuring here from the top of the top line of text to the edge, is 12 to 15 millimeters. The inner margin here can be as much as 12 millimeters. That's a little less than half an inch. The outer margin is about the same. 11 to 13 millimeters, and the margin at the bottom ranges between 9 and 12 millimeters here from the bottom of a descender in the bottom line of text to the edge of the page. Text here is not line matched as it often is not in uh, study Bibles, so neither the text here nor the notes at the bottom of the page is uh, line matched. So I will show you that here if I possibly can. You can see the shadows from the opposite side of the page are offset from the text on this side. Not quite lined up. The words translators add to smooth out the English that don't appear in the original languages are not in italic type or any special type in the English Standard Version. Pronouns for deity are not capitalized. In this particular edition, which is not uncommon for the English Standard Version, the words of Christ are in black ink. The text is not self-pronouncing. Uh, if you don't know what that means, let me show you. This is an older Oxford King James Version, and you see all the markings and breaks in the words Rebecca, Bethuel, Padanaram, Syrian, Laban. Those, along with a key at the beginning of the Bible, explain to you how to pronounce these words. Some translations, rather than use the L-O-R-D in all caps, as you see here, have gone to uh, Yahweh, um, the Legacy Standard Bible. The older Jerusalem Bible does that as well. But here you have the standard LORD in all caps, small caps for the O-R-D. The headings in the text are in about a 9.5 point bold italic uh, font, 
it does not, like some translations, show you how to find similar similar passages. So those are not listed there. There are page bottom text and translation notes, as well as references. They are all in about a six and a half point font. There are page bottom notes, uh, commentary from various authors. We'll take a look at this in more detail later. But here I'll just point out that the font, the capitals are about seven and a half points. Lowercase letters look closer to eight and a half points for me. To me, there are about 20,000 of these notes and about 60 of what this uh, Bible calls this passage in history callouts. I should probably show you the dust jacket you a better sense for those things. So this is the dust jacket. And there's nothing written on the back, except we do have the ISBN here, which I hope you can see. It should be in focus. And then the features here. It explains what it is. And features 20,000 study notes, 12 articles. We'll look at the articles in a minute. Glossary of historical figures. 60 of these This Passage in History call-outs, book introductions, and a full concordance, and then a little bit about the English Standard Version. The books in this Bible do begin on a fresh page, and as we saw, each has a brief introduction. This is the introduction to the book of Psalms, and it is printed in about a nine-point sans-serif font. Book titles are printed conveniently at the outside top of the page, as are the page contents. Page numbers are at the center top of the page. There are verse numbers. Here, when we have the text formatted as uh, poetry, you see that they're at the beginning of each verse. We go to some other place where we can see text and paragraphs. We'll be able to find the verse numbers without too much difficulty, although they are kind of small. So this is common in modern Bibles. You have a chapter number here at the beginning of the chapter, spanning about two lines of text. The chapter numbers are kind of large and bold and black. I consider the text itself to be sharp and black, but not particularly bold. There is some print non-uniformity. It's infrequent, but noticeable. I will show you that as best I can. So on the left you see page 21, and on the right is page 25. That's about as dark as it gets on the right, and it's about as light as it gets there on the left. So not too bad. I personally would prefer it if it were printed darkly throughout, but this is usable. The font in the text is advertised as a nine-point font. When I compare it to Times New Roman capital letters, are about nine points high. They're comparable to the Times New Roman nine point. Lowercase letters are about 9.5 to 10 points in Times New Roman measures. The line height, the distance from baseline to baseline is 3.85 millimeters. That's 10.9 points. And you can see quite a lot of white space between the lines which is a good design decision when the eye has to trace all the way across this uh, relatively wide column. Let's talk next about the paper. I measure the thickness of a single sheet to be 34.7 micrometers. Uh, the way I do that is I measure the entire text block divided by the number of sheets. Estimated paper weight is 32 GSM. The surface is fairly matte. There's a light sheen to it, but it's certainly not troublesome. The paper color is very nearly white. There's a light beige tinge to it. There is some show through. Words can be read through the paper. So if we, for instance, look in Psalms, go to the end of the book of Psalms, you'll be able to see through the paper and read from the opposite side of the page. So here, we should be able to see 149 from Psalm 149 on the other side. And you can read, sing to the Lord here. 
right beneath my thumb. If we get it to focus. That gives you a sense for the opacity of the paper. So we will move next to the back of the volume. This is the Book of Revelation. We come to a section entitled Ecumenical Creeds of the Church. And they have, uh, I think, four or three such creeds. Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Chalcedonian Definition. These are printed in a relatively small font. We then come to Articles and Resources. 24 pages in about an eight and a half point font here. So these are the articles that were mentioned on the dust jacket we saw earlier. And we may take a closer look at some of these. Some of the authors are familiar to those of you particularly who have a background with the reformed portion of the church. It's a table of weights and measures. It's one page in about that same 8.5 point font, followed by our reading plan. Reading plan covers nine pages. And then there's an author index. It's in two columns. It spans 13 pages, and it's in about a nine point font, too. Well, there are a number, number of names here that I recognize, but many of these names are quite unfamiliar to me. And this is one of the church history aspects of this Bible. Um, you can find quite a lot more information about these gentlemen on the internet. So this is a good starting point, particularly if you see a comment by one of these authors and you're interested in the background. Here is a thumbnail sketch of that individual, and then of course you can do your own research to find out more information. After that we come to the concordance, it's 88 pages long, in three columns. I estimate that there are over 3,000 words here. Um, I believe they may have said that at some point. Um, 14,000 context lines, and it's in about a six point font, all of it here both the caps, they're in about a six point bold font, and the context lines are written in about a six, six point font. Here we go, the editorial, the ESV Church History Study Bible Publishing Team. Then we come to the map section. There are 15 maps spanning 16 pages. They are on glossy paper, as you can tell. They're colorful, but not especially detailed. The maps do tend to stay out of the gutter. This one runs through the gutter, but I don't lose any material there. I don't see that I've lost much territory. A paper paste down liner and we're at the back of the hardback. As we saw earlier it's a brown hardback. It's a paste off construction. There are brown head and tail bands, a single brown ribbon marker in this brown hardback. The ribbon marker is I would say on the short side I think that should be an inch longer or so, but it isn't. It's definitely a sewn hardback, and you can see the stitching here between maps 7 and 8. The volume lies open in the book of Genesis, so we'll open it here and show you that. Let's open here, and we come to Genesis, and we have no problem at all keeping it open. It's a hard back, and of course it has a very flexible hinge to it. The text does drop away into the gutter, as you see here, so you have to press it flat to read the left page, and now of course the right page is dropping off into the gutter, so to read the 
right page you have to adjust the book. So we come into the book from the front we see the same construction as one page, two pages of heavy paper, presentation page. So there's the half title, um, a note here from Martin Luther on the left that says take away the scriptures and you take away the sun from the world. Full title page on the right and a uh, copyright page here so we're definitely uh, using the ESV text edition from 2016 as you would expect. It's uh, printed in China. This is the first printing in 2023. Table of contents. Sometimes I get criticized in these videos for not mentioning right up front uh, the contents of the book. This uh, Bible has the 66 books of the Protestant canon. There are ecumenical creeds of the church, which we've already seen listed on the table of contents. And here we have the articles and resources that we flipped through a moment ago, all listed in one spot. And the maps are all titled here. And the standard introduction to the ESV on the right, a little over one page long. The contributors, let you look at these names. Some of them should be familiar to you. These are people who contributed to selecting, I suppose, the notes, since the notes are largely written by historic authors. Um, there's a name here down here, author index, uh, Gavin Ortland, who's famous here on YouTube. In the preface to the ESV, moves for several pages and you come to the book of Genesis. Here's another gauge on the opacity. There's the word Genesis visible through the paper. Let's say a few words about the English Standard Version as a translation. Here's my translation continuum chart. This is a measure of literalness as I defined down there in the lower left. Essentially, uh, literalness has to do with the word-for-word -word character of the translation. It is not and should not be confused as a measure of accuracy of the translation. The ESV is a fairly literal translation. It's definitely on the left-hand portion of this chart. In the Old Testament, in terms of departures from the Masoretic text, I've looked at 100 different locations and the ESV does depart from the Masoretic text to a certain extent, but certainly not as often as other translations like the uh, New Revised Standard Version or the New American Bible Revised Edition, or definitely not as often as the New English Translation of the Septuagint. I have some scatter plots here that look at the New Testament textual basis. This one shows agreement with the Nestle Aland edition on the Y or vertical axis and with Robinson Pierpont which is essentially a stand-in here for the Byzantine text type on the horizontal axis and as you see it agrees with Nestle Aland quite frequently and not so frequently with Robinson Pierpont. Here is a similar chart which continues to show Nestle Lond on the y-axis but Westcott and Hort on the x-axis. Agreement with Westcott and Hort tends to be disagreement with Robinson Pierpont, so the chart is similar to a mirror image of the one that you just saw. In this chart you see agreement with Westcott and Hort on the y-axis and Robinson Pierpont on the horizontal or x-axis, and the ESV is up there in the cluster of modern translations that don't agree very much with Robinson Pierpont, um, but it is not showing a high, compared to say the New American Standard Bible family, a high degree of agreement with Westcott and Hort. And finally here's a scatter plot showing the Nestle Aland 28th edition, on the y-axis, Tyndall House Greek New Testament, a relatively recent Greek New Testament, on the horizontal axis. And the ESV um, is a little bit to the left in this uh, 
on the scatter plot, so it uh, doesn't agree with Tyndall House as frequently as a number of translations, like the New Revised Standard Version, the Old Revised Standard Version, or the American Standard Version. We'll start our font comparisons with the diadem, which is on the left, much smaller font. On the left now you see the Ancient Faith Study Bible, which is, seems to be a bit of a larger font. If we pan down the page, you can compare the size of the notes as well. On the left now is the Lutheran Study Bible in the English Standard Version. We will again pan down to show you the size of the notes. Quite a bit smaller, it seems, in the Lutheran Study Bible. And finally on the left, this is the ESV Study Bible, which is uh, printed a bit more darkly. And the notes. So smaller notes on the left in the ESV Study Bible. In the next section of the video, I'd like to give you a sense for the notes. So let's start here in Genesis 6. Um, do the notes give us any clue as to who the authors think, um, the authors of the notes think that the sons of God are in this passage? If we pan down, we see that note at 6.2 says, one would have thought that the sons of God should have looked for grace the heart rather than beauty in the face. I do not see anything here just skimming it that tells me who the sons of God are. So this uh, particular study Bible doesn't give you an opinion on that point. The note here is from John Flavel and the work is called Method of Grace in the Gospel Redemption. So we might be curious about who John Flavel is. Let's take a look at the index of author, and this is what we find. He lived from 1628 to 1691, so that spans the English Civil War. He's a nonconformist Puritan minister who wrote many books, including The Mystery of Providence, in latter years promoted the union of Congregationalists and Presbyterians. So if we keep reading down, we see this term Nephilim here, and we have a note, and the ESV text and translation set here that says, or giants, but if we pan on down, hoping to see an explanation for what the Nephilim are, there is no entry for Genesis 6-4. I've backed up a few pages now to look at this verse. This is Genesis 3-15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we'll look at the note at the bottom of the page. It begins at the bottom of this column and moves to the top of the next. So I'll let you read that. Please pause it if you need more time. We'll go to the next side. And uh, we see it ends with, this is undoubtedly a prediction of the Messiah's victory over Satan and his suffering from Satan and of the Messiah's people's victory and deliverance through him. And the note is from Jonathan Edwards, Types of the Messiah. I'll not look back to see the, the uh, biographical sentence about Jonathan Edwards, since I think we know who he is. Let's just uh, pan through all the notes down below on the second psalm. So we'll begin with the note here from Martin Luther on two one. So I'm not going to give you much time here, so please uh, just pause the video if you want to read the notes. I'd like to give you the opportunity to read the notes here on the second psalm. There's the note on two two, two three, two four, Quite a lot here on the second psalm. Two nine, ten through twelve, 
12 on the word kiss. So it begins and ends with uh, notes from Martin Luther. We're looking now at Isaiah 11.1. 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. It's interesting that not all the notes here are from Reformation era and more recent authors. Some of them go back to the earlier time. Here's one from uh, Afrahat, Demonstration 4.6. What a wondrous symbol of our Savior. Let's look to see what they say about him. So here's the entry, Syriac Christian known for his demonstrations, a series of homilies on 23 topics of faith and practice. I happen to have the ancient faith study Bible here open to the passage on the same individual and let's get that in focus and see it says uh, 270 to 350 flourished 337 to 345 the Persian sage the first major Syriac writer whose work survives he is also known by his Greek name Aphraates and then it gives you an index of where he has mentioned in this other study Bible. So I'll let you decide which one gives you more information that's useful to you. So this is called a church history study Bible, and one of the ways you can gain more information about church history is by looking up the authors in the back and then doing some of your own research. Another is by reading these 60 uh, insets, which they call uh, this passage in history. So here's one in Romans. Um, it's between the notes on 116 and 117 on Luther's breakthrough. And we'll pan up to the top of the next column so that you can finish reading that. We'll look at another one here in Romans. This one's called uh, Augustine's Conversion. It talks about the confessions and how he recalls the incident where he heard children's voices singing out tole lege, take up and read. And he read uh, the passage where his eyes fell when he opened the scriptures, fell upon Romans 13, 13 through 14. That moment God brought Augustine to himself, or Augustine, Augustine spoke of it as light flooding his heart and driving out the darkness. Here's another example of a note from an author from earlier in the church, earlier than the Reformation era. This one is on Matthew 24, 29, which reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. So this is from Cyril of Alexandria. It's fragment 271. We'll pan over to the other page. So the, whole cre um, so the whole creation, which had been created for the sake of humanity, is recapitulated and restored. In Matthew 27, you see this um, inset, this passage in history inset. This one's entitled St. Matthew's Passion. This is a page from Luke. Uh, this is the page that Luke chapter 4 begins on, and I just wanted to show you the variety of authors here at the bottom of the page whose commentary they're selecting. Adam Clark, who is an Arminian, John Owen, a Calvinist, J.C. Ryle, down. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, Baptist, famous Baptist preacher, Virgin again, George Whitfield, Matthew Henry, two Matthew Henrys come to the other page, and we see John Calvin, B.B. Uh, Warfield, Martin Bootser, and go back to the top of the page here, Erasmus, John Calvin, Albert Barnes, Thomas Manton, and John Wesley. So who is this Erasmus Sarsarius? Sarsarius. 
not a name familiar to me. Looking back at the author index, it turns out that he lived from 1501 to 1559. It's interesting to notice how many of these people, men at least, died in their 50s in those days. Lutheran theologian who studied under Luther and Melanchthon and spread the Reformation in the German Rhineland. I think we saw J.C. Ryle's name on that page as well, and he's just a little bit above Erasmus Sarsarius on the page. Ryle was uh, the first Anglican Bishop of Liverpool and a leading evangelical writer of his time. Devotional and pastoral works still widely read today. Here's the, this passage in History Inset on 1 Timothy 3.16 which explains why scholars think that this particular passage is a creed. Uh, Yaroslav Pelikan has observed how this text served as a model for the writing of creeds in the early church. If we go down one more note, we'll see one from Richard Sibbs on uh, 316, which in the King James Version reads, God was manifested in the flesh. Um, Sib's note, of course, is talking about God manifest in the flesh, so it would really fit better with a majority text-based translation. So here's the brief summary of Richard Sibbs. gives us dates, 1577 to 1635. Let's see if I do my math right, that means he was about 58, 58-ish when he died. English theologian and minister noted for many works. Um, Wikipedia mentions that he was an Anglican theologian. I believe he's also associated with William Perkins, and he was a Puritan. Just turning through the pages, I found this note on Psalm 18 by Pascal. Christian faith goes mainly to establish these two facts, the corruption of nature and the redemption by Jesus Christ. We'll wrap up the look at the notes by reviewing those here on Revelation chapter 20. It begins with a note at the bottom of the page on 22. Must be taken symbolically. It forms a contrast to the comparatively brief and broken sections of time that preceded it. It is formed of the round. We'll Come over here and get ready for the next page. Number of totality and earthly things. And this note is by Patrick Fairbairn, who I think was a Scottish minister. Next note is on 24. The triumph of Christ is shared not by the martyrs only, but by all who under the sway of the beast and the false prophets suffered reproach, boycotting, imprisonment, loss of goods, etc. This is from Sweet Commentary on Revelation. And then, this is the note on 2014. So you just have a few notes here. Uh, no great detail, no great exegesis of the passage, but some interesting comments by a few people who lived in various times through the history of the church. It's kind of interesting to me that um, this Bible indicates that the editors, and I think rightly, considered all of these people to be in the same church. Moving along to the essays, this is an interesting paragraph on the history of Bible translation essays by Peter J. Williams, talking here about Jerome, and it mentions that he translated Esther a word for word, but the apocryphal book of Judith in a sense per sense fashion. He says, with the exception of uh, Targumum, Jewish translations, um, almost all the early Bible translation tended to be literal. The translators usually felt free to paraphrase when necessary. The essay on church history in the patristic era uh, ends with a couple of paragraphs on Augustine. 
So in terms of the length of the brief essay, it does tend to put quite a lot of focus here on Augustine, which doesn't surprise me given the nature, the more or less reformed nature of the footnotes. In Fesco's essay on the Middle Ages, you see this about the Bible. The common caricature of medieval theologians is that they, they debated speculative questions such as how many angels could dance on the head of a pen. There is no historical evidence for that. Rather, most medieval theologians were serious students of the Bible. Here's the end of Steve Nichols' essay on the Reformation. This paragraph is Reformation After Effects. He talks about the fact that the Reformation led to the spirit of returning to the sources, going back to the original languages. Uh, it was a time of translation from the original languages into the vernacular, and the Reformation restored the sermon to the center of the church service. And there's an article here by Carl Truman on the role of tradition and I think this contrasts nicely with the just me and my Bible caricature that often is made of Protestantism. Confessional Protestants continue to hold self-consciously to the Reformation approach to tradition. Non-confessional Protestants in some circles of evangelical and fundamentalism typically shy away from historic confessions and references to tradition because they rightly wish to preserve the unique authority of Scripture. Yet the reality is not so simple. Such groups often develop their own statements of faith in order to guard the content of their beliefs, and they also utilize the extra-biblical vocabulary of the creeds and confessions. Indeed, unless one wishes to reinvent the faith afresh every Lord's Day, all Christians are dependent to a significant degree on tradition, as understood in the New Testament, whereby the content of the gospel has been tr transmitted to them by the church, in which they are then responsible to safeguard and transmit to the, to the next generation. He goes on to say, A better approach for all Protestants is to acknowledge the dependence of the Church in the present upon the exegetical and doctrinal insights and formulations of the past. There is no need to fear that this would necessarily compromise the authority of Scripture, as the Bible itself assumes such a concept of traditions. It also encourages us to be grateful for the work of previous generations in preserving and transmitting the faith. Further, this approach actually allows us to be appropriately self-critical since it formalizes and underscores for us the need to subject our human formulations to the norming authority of Scripture. So I hope this gives you enough insight um, so that you can make a decision on whether you would like to add this particular edition to your library. It is not, in terms of a uh, study Bible, it is not one that's going to give you a lot of insight into how to solve apparent uh, problems, disconnects, or contradictions in the scriptures. It is not going to give you detailed exegesis of passages. It will give you some insight into a few authors, um, the way they read the scriptures, their own particular perspectives. It will give you an opportunity to learn about authors that you perhaps don't know anything about, and then decide for yourself whether you would like to investigate reading them further. There are there on almost every page the people are mentioned that I do not know. I have Matthew Henry's full commentary set, but I do not know John Trapp as an example. It's printed well. I like the paper quite a lot. The paper has a very good feel to it. And it seems to be sufficiently opaque, sufficiently opaque to overcome the fact that it is not line matched. You do occasionally get a bit of a jumble coming through from the opposite side, but it's not horribly distracting. So with that, I think I'll conclude this, uh, this video. Thank you again for watching. Remember to uh, like the video if you did like it. Uh, you're always welcome to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. And uh, thank you for your time.